Mark chapter 10, verse 46, we have this blind man called Bartimaeus seated outside the city gates of Jericho. As they are walking, Jesus is walking past. Did Jesus have a plan to heal Bartimaeus? Yes or no? How many of you say no? Raise your hands. You all are a set of liars. <laughs> so many said no. And then when I ask you to raise your hands, you don't want to raise your hands. How many of you said no? Can you raise your hands? Honestly, to a priest itself. And then there are priests for confessions, right? <laughs> now go there and say, just father, two minutes ago, I said lies and came. How many of you said that Jesus planned to have that healing that day? Can you raise your hands? Okay, good. So I'm not saying anything is right or anything is wrong. But one thing is sure, Jesus was passing by. And it doesn't necessarily say in the scriptures that Jesus kind of saw Bartimaeus. Because Jesus was drawn to the attention of Bartimaeus' voice. He throws away his cloak and that in itself, that whole Bartimaeus incident in itself, and maybe at some point later, um, we'll, we'll have another chance to open it out. That in itself is a beautiful moment of active healing that takes place. But I'm just dealing with one thing. He cries out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He cries out so much that what do the people say? Sorry? They, tell, they try to stop him. They say, stop. You're sounding so foolish. It's irritating. Have you ever heard that even in our churches? Have you seen that same attitude with us as well? I don't want to scream out. I don't want to cry out. We are very decent people who pray. We pray decently. You know, when you're in church and that tear starts trickling down, what is the first thing you do? Yes, you'll take out your handkerchief and you will wipe it. We don't want anybody to see that we have tears. If God didn't want us to cry, he wouldn't give us tears. It is meant to be shed. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Bartimaeus cried out and everyone told him, you keep quiet. It sounds, it doesn't sound nice. First of all, you're a miserable beggar sitting at the roadside and now you're disturbing him. He's not going to listen to you. You don't have to scream out. But for Bartimaeus, that moment was very important. If Bartimaeus did not scream out that day, Jesus would not have stopped. Because the scripture tells us very clearly, as Bartimaeus kept crying out, Jesus stood still. And then he said, bring him here. He's not even seen him. Bring him here. So what is there? Jesus has actually heard him. Now, of course, we can always say like that's one of the main excuses we make. Jesus is not deaf. I don't have to scream. Isn't that true? That's one of the things we say, right? Jesus is not deaf. Why we have to scream? Sometimes I look at poor, poor Jerry. Yesterday he was with a youth and he was trying to get the youth to open their mouth. You know how the youth are. They will open their mouth everywhere else except the church. And of course, in front of their parents, they don't open their mouth anyway. So, but uh, sometimes you have this in, in, in praise and worships as well. When uh, we we'll, we'll keep asking them, sing aloud, sing aloud, cry out to Jesus. And then one whisper will come out. Why? Because we always hold the excuse that Jesus can hear everything. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. If Jesus could hear everything, then Bartimaeus didn't have to scream. But there is a significance in, that, in the meaning of that scream, that cry that comes forth from Bartimaeus. There's actually a significance to that scream. We have in Luke chapter 17, the lepers, the 10 lepers who were healed. Do you remember that? Yes, there were 10 lepers who, was, who were on the wayside. Jesus was passing by. He had no intentions to touch and heal them, but he he gets to know that they are there is because they, because they, they cried out. They cried out, have mercy on us. 
and Jesus stops and he tells them, go and show yourselves to the, to the priest. And then on the way, um, they get healed. One of them comes back. You remember the incident? Okay. So there's them crying out. These are all active, um, active healings where there is that cry that is offered unto, unto God. In the scriptures, we read about this time and again, people who cried. When you cry out, it is because of the pain within. The struggle within, the battle within, where the battle within is far more important than what people's opinions are about the way I'm expressing that battle. So when I am wounded, when I'm struggling and I'm hurt and I'm in terrible pain, I express that to an extent that I'm not bothered what you think about my way of expression. We have this as an example in, in the book of prophet Samuel connected to the mother of Samuel. The mother of Samuel, she doesn't have children. Her name is, very good. Her name is Hannah. Hannah doesn't have children and she's weeping and crying over this. So her husband comes and tells her, you know, all these husband comes, these husbands come up with these one-liners that have no, no sense in it. So he goes up to, to her when she's weeping and crying. Sometimes husbands need to just know, they don't need to say anything. Just keep quiet. Just sit next to them. Isn't that true? Sometimes isn't that what you want? You don't want a solution. A, husband, a wife actually told me once, Father, please tell him, I don't want a solution. Just sit next to me. But the man cannot do that. Men don't know how to sit next to a person. They, need, they, they know only how to dish out solutions. Don't worry. When I say they, I mean me also. But I'm not married. So, but I have the benefit of being a priest. You come to me for solutions. But when your husband gives it, you don't want to listen. Sometimes the husbands tell us, Father, I told her the same thing. She won't listen. <laughs> you told her, now suddenly it's all okay and fine. <laughs> Praise God. But that's how we men are. We men need to dish out solutions all the time. So, all the time. And um, we have, we have uh, Hannah's husband, who Hilkiah, who comes to her and says, when she's weeping and crying by the, because of the fact that she doesn't have a baby, he comes to her and he says, am I not like 10 children to you? Honestly, what a dumb statement. <laughs> you are not. You are my husband. <laughs> You're not going to be like 10 children to me. She doesn't even bother to respond to him. She weeps and cries. She's expressing the pain in her heart and it is coming forth in the temple in that cry that she's giving so much so that the, the priest in the temple, Eli, comes to her and gets angry because he thinks she is drunk. And he tells her, how dare you come into the house of God drunk? So that means her expression of her pain must have been to that extent that someone actually thought that she was drunk. But that can come only when you actually hurt so much within. Or else, you'll always be conscious about what others think about your cry, what others think about your tears, how people judge you. So it hasn't yet really hit your heart. You haven't reached a stage where you've run out of all options. It's only when we run out of all options that that cry actually comes forth. That cry that is offered and that is what, that is what the Lord wants us to, to give as well. Offering that cry unto the Lord. That's one of, one of the most important moments for a pass, uh, an active healing. When you offer your, your first cry unto the Lord. Irrespective of what people around you think. What opinions they have about you or how you've expressed yourself. And what they think about that expression as well. Isn't it surprising sometimes that we can let out these cries of joy and excitement when we see human beings? But when it comes to the Lord, sometimes we are very reserved. You see, um, 
I don't know. Uh, you you see a, 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 a you see a cricketer, and and you can get so excited. You know, oh wow, I met this person. You take a selfie, and and there's that scream. And if uh, you know, for for sometimes if it's the girls, they have that screech, not just a scream. And there's a screech. Um, that excitement that you feel. Once uh, we, I was in the retreat center in in India at that time with Father Augustine over there. And we had finished the retreat on Friday. I was going to Bangalore, taking the flight to Bangalore for a retreat in Bangalore. So at the airport, at Cochin Airport, um, I was seated over there at the boarding gate. And then suddenly someone came up very excitedly behind me and said, Oh, Father Michael, Father Michael, Father Michael, and came and touched me. It was one of the retreatants who had just attended the retreat. So they were very excited about it, spoke to me a lot. And then suddenly there was a buzz around the place. And then these people who were looking straight at me, they didn't even stop. They just turned and started following someone else. And when I looked, it was a very famous film star from India in Kerala. It's called Mohanlal, very famous film star there. And they turned and then, oh, wow, Mohanlal, oh, wow, Mohanlal, everyone's screaming out. I thought, okay, well, fine. And uh, they went off. They never came back after that. We got into the same flight and I'm seated around two seats behind this film star. And once the plane landed in, in Bangalore, uh, I don't know if you Sri Lankans do it, we Indians are very famous for this. Barely will it touch down, everyone will stand up. <laughs> like as though they want to jump out of the emergency exit. <laughs> It's, it's, a closed, it's a closed vehicle. You can't get out. It won't get into our brains. And they'll immediately stand up and then busy taking out the bag. And then suddenly I can feel two people screaming and pushing me. And I turned and looked. It is these people who have attended the retreat. They are pushing me because if they push fast enough, they'll get to stand next to this film star. Those are the days we come down onto the earth. <laughs> we have our feet grounded and we know who we are. But you know, just, just see the excitement that is in us when we see uh, people of even human beings who are, who are popular. Uh, some, of these, um, some of these concerts, you'll see them screaming out, these youth, you'll see them screaming out like as though their life is in front of them. It's amazing, isn't it, that we can, we can scream out when it comes to human beings and, and people who are popular, but when it comes to the Lord, how reserved we become. How we hold back. There's no one who touches our life as much as our Lord. And yet for him, we give in little minute bits. When we praise, we decide how much I want to praise, how much I hold back. Why is it that when it comes to the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, the Almighty, we cannot cry from our heart? Why is it suddenly we become so conscious about how people will look at us and how they will judge us? When you cry in the presence of Jesus, only one person is going to look at you with compassion, and that is Jesus. All the others might judge you. All the others might size you up, but they are not going to do anything for you. He's the only one who will feel what you feel. He's the only one who will understand that tear of yours that you're shedding. And how often we cry, maybe in the secrets of our rooms and in the secrets of our life, but we are weeping and we are crying. But no one thing, every time you cry, your Lord sees those tears. He feels that pain. He knows more than anyone else, he knows what you're going through. He feels that pain. And then it becomes far more important and significant to cry in his presence, to offer those tears in his presence. We read in Psalm 6, verse 6. 
Psalm 6 verse 6. Is it up there? Psalm 6 verse 6. Not coming up? No. I am weary with my mourning. Every night I flood my bed with tears. I flood my bed with tears. How many times we've reached those stage where, where it is either because of our family, because of ourselves, because of our own battles, but we've reached that stage where I flood my bed with my tears. My pillow gets soaked in my tears. But Jesus wants us to cry unto him with that kind of a passion. I have no one else to go to. I have no one else I can trust in. So my tears are directed towards my Lord. We read in Psalm 42 verse 3. Psalm 42 verse 3. Psalm 42 verse 3. Can you read that? Can't read it out loud. My tears have been my food day and night. My tears have been my food day and night because I don't know who else to turn to. I don't know how I'm going to solve, my solu solve this problem, how I'm going to find a solution for my problem. I don't know how my family is going to get touched. I don't know how my children are come out, going to come out of this situation. I don't know how I'm going to come out of this addiction. I don't know how my spouse is going to be delivered from this addiction. I don't know what to do. I weep. I cry and that cry comes from my heart. And when that cry comes from my heart, the Lord holds those tears. There's not one teardrop of ours that will go unaccounted. Not one teardrop that will go unaccounted. We read in Psalm 56 verse 8. Psalm 56 verse 8. Psalm 56 verse 8. Can we read? Record my lament List my tears on your scroll. Are they not in your record? In the NRSV, this is the, this is the translation that is given. Psalm 56 verse 8. It says, you have kept count of my tossings. Put my tears into your bottle. Are they not in your record? You have put my tears into your your bottle it is held by the Lord he doesn't ignore that tear it is not a tear that is forgotten human beings forget tears you can weep in front of me I'll feel sad that you're weeping but after some time I won't remember that you shed tears in front of me of course if you hold on to me and shed all that tears on to me then it has happened a few times where, where they'll come and they'll be weeping and they'll be weeping and because we have this cassock, uh, the, the full sleeves on, then, then the cry will come from here. It will be held, the, the, the cassock sleeve will be held and weeping and crying and then everything will be here. <laughs> it's okay, apart from that, I won't feel anything. I'm sorry to tell you. But I won't feel so much. I might feel sorry for you at that moment, but I'll forget your tears. I remember a classmate of mine, I can say this because he's a non-Christian, so I'm sure he'll never get to hear this. Uh, so a classmate of mine, when we, um, he was in love with a girl, this was when we were in uni, and he was in love with a girl, last day of the, of the um, uh, course, and uh, everyone's then going on their own own ways. And I think she was going to the north of India or something. So the two of them met up and, and there was the last buys and the, and the sadness and the grief. And that time we didn't have mobile phones, you know, where you just, you have to make calls. So, and he comes back and, uh, and he comes back with his handkerchief and he said, when she was crying, I, I wiped it with my handkerchief. I will hold this always dear to me. So recently all of us were on WhatsApp and everything. And he, he said something that was pretty funny because he said he's now married, not to that girl, to someone else. Okay. 
and when they went home for a holiday he now has three kids big kids actually but he went home for a holiday to his ancestral house his wife was going through a lot of the old stuff in his room and then found this handkerchief nicely kept over there inside with her initials on it so she asked him what is the what's this why have you kept this over here and then he said the trouble he had and the lies he had to say because if she came to know that it was someone else's tears on that he said i've had it but that is exactly what it is on that last day he was so dramatic about it took all the tears soaked it up and then it's dumped somewhere that's how human beings are but you have a god who the scripture says you have bottled my my tears and that is why i said there'll be not one tear of yours that will go away without being accounted for because he will then weep with you when you cry he cries with you revelation chapter 7 verse 17 revelation chapter 7 verse 17 for the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd he will guide them to the springs of the water of life and god will wipe away every tear from their eyes every tear that comes forth from that cry that you offer unto the lord the lord wipes it away when jesus um goes to the house of martha and mary after lazarus dies you know that incident John chapter 11 where where uh, Lazarus passes away Lazarus dies and Jesus comes there how many days late was Jesus I can't hear you how many days late was Jesus 4 days how many of you say 4 days can you raise your hands honestly how many of you said 4 days raise your hands now you don't get a chance to change your opinion praise the lord How many of you say he was 3 days late? Good. How many of you say that he was 5 days late? No. 1 day late? No. Praise the Lord. Who told you he was late? <laughs> the Bible never says that. You decided for yourself he's late. <laughs> But that's how it is always with us, right? We always decide Jesus is late. everything's over now lord now what's the use my child fought with me he's gone away he's taken my grandchildren and gone away now they are not there what's the use it's all over he's late for everything he's late jesus i wanted that promotion that promotion was the most perfect promotion for me i worked so hard for it now someone else got it i'll never get another promotion now you're late now what's the use every time jesus is late the scripture never tells us jesus is late it just says that when he came lazarus was dead four days that is all it says martha and mary say lord now what's the use when jesus says remove the stone they say there will be a stench it's been four days martha and mary pretty much resemble what we are lord there's already a stench now what are you going to do but there's something significant the shortest verse in the scriptures is given in this incident do you know what that is what's that he wept he stood in front of the tomb and he wept when you weep jesus weeps with you when you shed a tear and you think that the lord doesn't understand he sits beside you and he weeps with you and so every time you're offering that cry it is not going to deaf ears it is not going to ears that judge you when you're in the presence of the lord cry unto him if you if you want to initiate an active healing you cry unto the lord There's nothing wrong in humbling ourselves and telling Jesus, "Yes, Lord, I need your I need your intervention." If I don't have your intervention, I don't know where else to go. And that is what happens with the woman who who's who's with hemorrhage. 
when she, after 12 years, she was suffering for 12 years with hemorrhage, with that bleeding. And after 12 years, the word says, she spent all her money on, on doctors. So what has happened after that? Nothing, yes. But something else also happened. Her money is over. She spent all her money on, on doctors. And then there is no money. When there is no money, she turns to, then she turns to the Lord. When she knows I have nowhere else to go. We, if we are to cry, it comes only when we realize I have nowhere else to go. If coming here is one of your options, then today's retreat is not going to make any difference to you. Because you have, you have another option planned. If there's another option planned, our intensity will never be there. If there is a last bus that is going to go towards, towards the city and you have no other mode of transport and if there's a last bus, is it time? No? You're taking your bed and going home? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> so if there's a last bus over here, there's no other mode of transport, no petrol, nothing. There's no other mode of transport. From here, the last bus is going to come and you have to catch that last bus. You know, you know the drop that there is, right? Will you coolly walk? What would you do? Yeah, you could be a sprinter, you could be a marathoner, or you could be a whatever. You know, your body shape and everything might not be conducive for running. It doesn't matter. You will roll down. But you will see to it that you get there before the last bus. Why? Because there's no other bus after that. When we have a second option and a third option and a fourth option, that cry doesn't come. Bartimaeus didn't have a second option. A blind beggar who sits by the roadside didn't have a second option. The lepers who cried out didn't have a second option. The woman with hemorrhage didn't have a second option. All the healings and miracles in the scriptures that you see are people who didn't have a second option. That is when people get intense in their cry unto the Lord. That is when you initiate that healing. That cry telling Jesus, I have no other option. I remember a person who came to our retreat center in India and um, was praying. His, his hands and his legs would shiver and shake all the time. He had no, no control over it. And he was, he was praying. One week he attended the retreat. The second week I saw him again for the retreat. He told me, Father, pray. I need to get healed. And I told him, I'll pray. Second week, the retreat got over. No healing as yet. And third week I saw him there. I told him, why don't you go home? He said, no, I haven't got healing as yet. He said, I cannot go home without a healing. I'm, I'm, my, I'm not able to do my job. I'm not able to meet expenses of my family. I cannot go home. And I thought to myself, I hope he'll just go home. He might not be disappointed. Third week, he attended the retreat. Fourth week, he attended the retreat. Their retreats happen week after week after week. Fourth week. Then you start feeling really sorry for the person. At the end of the fourth week, he comes to me and he says, Father, my hands have been healed. The hands that have been shaken, completely healed and steady after that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Fifth week of the retreat, he's still sitting over there. And I came into, I went to him and said, why are you here? Why can't you go home? He said, Father, my legs not yet healed. I think he waited on for, um, for five or six retreats, but he has, he has come after that few times to the retreat center as well, completely healed. But these are people, even in our retreat center, so many healings and miracles here, around here, so many healings and miracles. It's only when people reach that stage where they think, I have no one else but Jesus. If you can depend on your intellect, if you can depend on your body, if you can depend on your money, if you can depend on your family, if you can depend on your spouse, I'm telling you, you will not depend enough on Christ. That's definite. If I know I have another option that I can touch, I can feel, I can access, I will definitely use those options. 
So you ask yourself today, is Jesus your last option? If Jesus is not your last option, you haven't yet got there. You haven't yet got to the stage where you will actually cry unto the Lord and tell him I have no one else but you. That is from where all these active, active healings started taking place. When they started crying out unto the Lord, Hannah didn't have children. She cried and she cried and she cried. And God gave her a prophet. And God gave her her prophet. You cry unto the Lord. Don't be ashamed to shed those tears. And if those tears fall, don't take out your handkerchiefs. Let it fall and tell Jesus, Lord, you collect it into your bottle because I want you to hold my tears close to your heart. And he will not disappoint you. But be free enough with your God to offer those tears unto him and that cry unto him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.